And when we look at Paul addressing this church, when he addresses them and identifies the most characteristic thing about them, he identifies their faith. That they were a people of great faith. Verse uh, 8 of chapter 1 of Romans, he says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. These were folks, they knew one another, they, they weren't just a church on the corner that knew about one another's lives, but the whole entire world had a sense of who they were because of their great faith. You know, Paul was hearing wonderful things. Paul hadn't been to Rome. Paul was wanting to go to Rome, and part of why uh, Paul was writing to them was that he had not been able to go, and he wanted to address some issues that they needed to, to, to know about and be established by. But he was hearing, you know, all the roads led to and from Rome back in that period of history, and Paul would hear people talking about this church in Rome. He would get reports about this church in Rome. And there, there seemed to be always the same theme of a, a people of great faith a people of great faith. And he wasn't hearing about that they had big buildings or huge budgets or that they had great music programs or large attendance or a great chariot ministry or anything like that. He was hearing about faith, that they were a church of great faith. And that is a wonderful, wonderful thing to be the overall higher message of a church. You know, people may look at the church in America today and from the outside, they may see some amazing structures. Some of the churches in America are huge. They may see churches that have multi-million dollar budgets. They may see churches that have you know, tens of thousands that will come from Sunday to Sunday to go to that particular church. But you know, Paul would come and he would look at any particular church, no matter what size it was, how much the resources were, he would look at it and he would ask the same question. Where is the faith? Where is the faith? Where is the evidence of people who are trusting God? People who are believing God's promises. People who are standing on his word and are living lives of faith, showing the world there's something different about knowing Jesus Christ. You know, in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, there's a verse that talks about, uh, you know, Jesus says, when the Son of Man returns, then he asks a question. Will he find faith on the earth? When the Son of Man returns, he's going to find churches. He's going to find Baptists. He's going to find people that will be you know, in attendance at a particular church that, that week, whatever that week is that he returns. But the question he's asking is, will he find faith? Now, are we a people, are we a church of faith? Not that just we can dress up, we can look good on a Sunday morning, that we have a good crowd that comes out, but are we a people that really believe and trust God, know his word, act, act out in our lives in a way of faith, of trusting him and believing him for great, great things in our life? And that was the way that this church in Rome was. Now, you might ask the question, where, where would this faith come from? Why did it exist in this particular church? Well, one of the things I want to talk about this morning is, and the primary thing is that the reason I think that it was there is because people like Paul were praying for this church and for faith, for a healthy church to be in existence in Rome. And God was answering that those prayers. And if we want faith, if we want to be a strong church, believing God, uh, taking God at his promises and allowing God to do great things through us, Prayer is going to be a central part of that. If we want Hollybrook to be like that, we're going to have to be a people who are specifically praying for that to happen in the life of our church. In verse 9, it says this. It says, For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers making requests. Paul constantly prayed for these people. He would pray for them, and then he'd hear great things. So he'd pray some more, and he'd hear more great things. He'd pray again, and he'd hear more, more great things. He had this victorious circle that was going on that was constant. He'd pray, and God would do great things. He'd pray, and God would do great things. We want to get in on that. We want God to do things like that in the life of our church as well. And, you know, Paul gives us some clues. And we're going to look at some verses this morning. We're going to look at verse uh, 8 through 13, and we're going to get some clues as to why 
these things were happening in the life of this church, how they had such a strong faith, and, you know, Paul, what he prayed for them, and we're going to get an evidence of Paul's prayer life as well, and then challenge our own prayer life. You know, what are the things that we should be praying for? What are the things that should be a part of when we spend time with God that should be the priorities that we have? If you looked at Paul's prayer list, and we have evidence of it through what he wrote, you see that Paul prayed for people, he prayed for places, he prayed for churches, you see specific names of people. And here he says, for God is my witness that he prays. God knows whether we pray or not. He knows what we pray. He knows exactly what your prayer life is like. And the question I want us to answer this morning is, what is God looking for in your prayer life and my prayer life? I'm going to ask you, if you would, if you take your Bibles or just pay attention to the screen, and we're going to look at just a handful of verses this morning. So if you'd join with me in standing, we're going to read verse 8 and go through verse 13. It says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit and the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. Always in my prayers making request, if perhaps now, at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you, and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also even as among the rest of the Gentiles. Let's bow in prayer. Father, I pray this morning that you would challenge our prayer lives, challenge that time that we spend with you. I pray that you'd teach us what prayer is meant to be, teach us what you seek to find in the prayers that we pray. I pray that you would, through your Holy Spirit, just invade the, the life of our church, help us to do what is necessary to become a people of great faith so that great prayers can be prayed and great answers can be received, and you can, you can receive the glory for all that is done through the life of our church. Bless us this morning, and I pray that you'd speak to us through your word. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, a few things I want us to think about, and they couldn't be more simple. We talk about our prayer life, uh, just some very obvious things that I think God is concerned about in our prayer life that I, that I find in these verses. Uh, the first is this, that God is concerned whether we pray. God is concerned whether you pray. God is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayers making requests. You know, statistics tell us that the average person prays about 30 seconds a day. About 30 seconds a day. Now, that is not a prayer life. You know, how strong would any relationship you have in life be if you only invested 30 seconds a day in it? And prayer is, is no different than that. Uh, if you try to determine, and most of our prayer, prayer lives are... Uh, a gathering of different things, but if you began to kind of section out some things and then see what you had left in your prayer life, you might be amazed at that. If you try to determine what your true prayer life is and you took out three things, number one, you took out prayers of formality. Maybe you open and close a meeting or something. You sit at a meal and you pray for that meal and you remove those things out of considered prayer life each day. And then you removed uh, uninitiated prayers where you don't just go and you get before God and pray, but somebody asks you maybe to pray for this or pray for that. You, you remove the times that you pray in that way. And then here's the big one. You remove your wish list. Take that out of your prayer life. And some of you say, well, that is my prayer life, is a wish list. But you remove that out as well. And then see what you have left. You know, all the things that people ask you to pray for or self-serving prayers, you remove all those things out and see what you have left to call a prayer line. You know, Abraham Lincoln came up and said to a boy, he asked this question, he said, son, if a dog has four legs and a tail and you call the tail a leg, then how many legs does he have? The boy, thinking about it, said, well, I guess he has five legs then. 
And Lincoln's answer was, no, it doesn't matter what you call the tail. The tail is a tail. He's only got four legs. And it doesn't matter what we call prayer. How God really defines prayer is going to tell us what prayer is. And many times we come before God and we say, God, you know, this is a great idea. This will really make a difference in your kingdom. Let's focus on this in my prayer life. And God is wanting us to be hearing him and praying back to him what really matters. But often we have our own list and we define that as prayer in our lives. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Thanksgiving is to be a part of all of our prayers. But notice how he divides prayer and supplication, where supplication is primarily what we call prayer. That there is another part of our relationship to God that is prayer apart from asking God for this and this and this and this and this. That prayer is primarily time with God. Time in his presence. Maybe saying nothing. And allowing him to speak to you. That prayer is enjoying the presence of God, part of which is asking God for things. The primary part is hearing what God wants you to ask. And then asking appropriately according to his will. And it's separate. And you think about, about how Paul prayed. And again, I mentioned that he prayed for people, he prayed for churches, he prayed for places. But also, when he prayed for himself, he prayed for, for being successful in reaching people. He prayed that God would give him the power to do the ministry that God had called upon his life to do. That's how he prayed what we might consider selfish prayers, so that he might be more able to reach out to other people and make a difference. Now, when you think about your prayer life, whether you do pray, is your prayer life a real and genuine prayer life by God's definition? Are you praying things God wants to hear, that God has placed upon your heart? The most accurate barometer of your spiritual life is your prayer life. Whatever it consists of, the health of it, that is the most telling thing about who you are and where you are spiritually. And if I, if, you know, if I gave you the assignment of just reading Paul's writings and writing down all the different things of, of how he prayed, I think you'd be amazed that there is so much language and discussion in what he wrote about him praying and how to pray and what was on his heart, what he was asking God for. It just fills all of his writing. He just breathed prayer. Prayer is to be a part of everything and all that we are. Jesus was a person of prayer. Jesus was spending entire nights in prayer. We shouldn't be anything else, and our church shouldn't be anything less than that. If we want to be a church of great faith and power, then we're going to have to allow prayer to be the primary vehicle to get us there. The second thing that, again, is obvious, God is not just concerned whether you pray, but he's concerned how you pray. Paul says here, how unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayers making requests. Prayer was a constant thing for the Apostle Paul. And he was the one that wrote, pray without ceasing. And prayer is to be something that is a continuous activity that, that we do in our life. My daughter came to see me this week and she, she came and sat in the office and was talking to me and her phone just kept going. Brr, brr. She was, you know, texting without ceasing was going on. She has this connection with all these friends, and they just text and the text and text. And it just, every minute, there was another text that was coming in. She'd pick it up, and she'd write back, put it back down, and it would go again. You know, that constant connection that's going on. You know, we are to have that with God in a sense. If you would have cut, cut Paul, he would have bled a prayer. It was just something that circulated through who he was. And I would think the most normal posture that he might take in life would be a kneeling posture. In fact, I heard of a, one of our Baptist missionaries who went to the house of an older man in Africa, and this older man shared with him that he had been led to the Lord through a relationship, a conversation that he had with Andrew Murray. And that's probably a familiar name because Andrew Murray, who lived many years ago, is one of the most popular writers about the deeper life. And I've got many books on Andrew Murray that, that are in my, my library. And this missionary went and talked with him, and uh, this older man shared that 
that Andrew Murray's father had a practice of every Friday night that he would fast and pray and not eat that night, and he would pray for revival. And Andrew Murray himself picked up that habit, and this man went over to Murray's house on a Friday night asking him to pray about a particular issue. And he said Murray just kind of went down into a prayer posture as it was the most natural thing that he'd ever seen anybody do. This guy tried to get down with him, and it was, you know, he'd have to fix his pants and everything to try to get down there and try to get comfortable. And then he got kneeling beside him, and it was just this long silence. Then after a long silence, he heard Murray say, Oh, Father! And then a long silence again. And then suddenly Murray began to just pour out one thing after another before God in prayer. And as this man with, was with him, and they went through this prayer time, he said it seemed like hardly any time had gone by at all, and he heard this knock on the door. Somebody was at the door saying, uh, Mr. Murray, Mr. Murray, it's breakfast time. Are you going to eat breakfast this morning? He said they had spent the whole night in prayer, and it seemed like hardly any time at all had gone past. You know, prayer is meant to be as natural in your spiritual life as breathing, breathing is to your, your physical life. Just something that naturally happens for us spiritually. And not a difficulty, not a burden, not a hardship, but something that's very natural for us. The third thing is God is not just concerned whether you pray or how you pray, but God is concerned what you pray. Always in my prayers, making requests. <clears throat> If perhaps at na now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. Paul prayed specific prayers. You know, God cannot gain the glory from general prayers. And one of the indicators of a lazy uh, prayer life is praying in broad gen generalities. You know, God bless the sick or uh, save the lost or bless the missionaries. You know, God is out there going, which one? Which one are we talking about? We're just throwing out these general prayers, and God can't get any glory from that. If he answers it, who's going to know? Paul prayed specific prayers. Paul let people know, you are on my prayer list. I am praying for you. He was very specific about it. And if you look through, uh, through biographies of great people that God used in a great way, you will see that one of the things that's a common thread for them is they took time to listen to God get a word from God, and to act in faith on that word. They took time to hear from God. In fact, if you read uh, George Mueller's biography, George Mueller ran, a, ran an orphanage, and one of the things that was unique about him, if he prayed for $2,000.38, <clears throat> George Mueller would see God more in the $0.38 cents than the $2,000. He said that would honor God more when it came in that precise of an answer. Now, are you doing what you do? out of a sense of God having spoken to you and you acting in faith as a response to spending time with him? Or are you just doing what you do because it seems like the right thing to do, the proper way for a Christian to act? It's just the way we do it. Or has God spoken to your life? Paul was specifically saying that he desired to go to Rome. He was praying for a prosperous journey to go to Rome, that God would give him success in doing that. And you know, Paul did three years later make it to Rome. God did answer that prayer. But you know that Paul made it to Rome, and he called it successful journey. And the reason that he called it that, because he achieved God's ministry objective in getting there. And along the way, God did what God wanted to do. But if, you read, if you've read what happened to Paul in those three years to get him to Rome, he was attacked, he was arrested, he was jailed. He was slapped. He had spent years in prison. He went through trials before different leaders. Uh, he was in a storm at sea. He was shipwrecked. He was snake bit. Now, that's not on my, any of my prayer lists, any of those things to happen to me. But, you know, when Paul prayed to be successful in getting to Rome, he didn't put any uh, demands on God. And God did it God's way. And it was a prosperous journey because he made it to Rome, but more so because lives were changed all along the way. That's the way God made it, a success. You know, Corrie ten Boone in The Hiding Place, she writes about all these different experiences that she had in German prison camps. 
And one of the things that happened where she learned a very important lesson, she had a sister whose name was Betsy that was a very godly woman, and Betsy would lead the Bible studies that they would have in the barracks. And one of the times that they came to a Bible study, it was about rejoicing always in everything. And Betsy challenged everybody in that Bible study to rejoice for every detail of the imprisonment they were in. And Corey Ten Boom refused flatly to thank God for the fleas that infested that barrack. And she refused to, to thank God for it. But God began to deal with her heart, and she finally got to the point where she thanked God for the fleas, that little thing in life. There may be a little thing in life that you need to stop and say, God, I hate this, but I'm going to thank you for every detail that somehow you're going to even use this for, for somehow to bless my life. Well, she found out later that the fleas were the reasons that the guards would not enter in there and interrupt their Bible study time. Otherwise, the guards would be all over them. The guards wouldn't allow them to do the things they did, but the fleas kept the guards away. The defining factor of a successful journey is not our comforts or wants being met, but God touching other lives through ours. You know, Paul won souls all along the way, and it demanded a lot out of him, but that didn't matter. Paul didn't pray for a comfortable life. Paul prayed that God would use him. And you know how, how much has God used you this, this week? How many lives have you touched? You think more about, I've been comfortable this week. Are you praying like Paul is praying? When you pray for yourself, do you pray, God, use me whatever the cost? You know, God is concerned what we pray for. God is concerned whether we pray, how we pray, what we pray for. And finally, God is concerned why we pray. Verse 11 says, For I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. That is that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us, by the other's faith, both yours and mine. Paul was praying that he might be a benefit to other people, that he might impart a spiritual gift, that he might encourage them, that, he, that others might benefit from his faith. Now, let me ask you this. Why are you in church today? You know, what is your reason for being here? What are you most concerned about? Are you more concerned about somebody ministering to you? Somebody saying something to you somehow? Are you going to walk out saying, well, I didn't like this. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. Was that the reason that you were here today? If Paul showed up at church today, he would show up to use his spiritual gift. He would show up to encourage somebody. He would show up to somehow be a benefit to somebody else. He would pray that God would use him that way. Did you pray that God would use you today in that specific way? That God, let me go to church today and let my spiritual gift, let my life somehow touch somebody else, let somebody else be encouraged, let their faith be strengthened because I show up at church today. That's what Paul would pray for, that God would do that in his life. He told Timothy... A young pastor, he told Timothy to stir up the gift of God which is in you. And you may have a gift in your life that is in there that is being pressed down that needs to get out and get active and get alive. To touch somebody's life. And God sent you to church today to exercise that gift. And somebody needed it. Somebody needed to be touched by it. But many of us get to be... Uh, you know, pew potatoes, and we get used to just soaking up information. And we never get it out and get the, get the gift going in our life and get it circulating. I shared with a Wednesday night crowd once that when I, was, when I was back in the late 1980s, that there was a period of time that I was not uh, allow, I was in a situation where I could preach and teach for a while. But I still studied. And I had this stuff just building up inside of me and building up inside of me. And I had a habit of going jogging around a lake area in Manfred, Oklahoma, and it was the off-season, and yet they have this um, amphitheater area, and I'd jog by it every day, and I'd always just get kind of, kind of magnetic pull toward it. There was nobody there. There's nobody in the park. Maybe a ranger would drive by every once in a while. And one, one uh, day I just gave in a temptation and went down there and stood behind the podium and just preached a whole sermon to empty seats. You know, this stirred-up gift was driving me nuts. 
And you shouldn't be able to be comfortable. You know, Paul prayed that he would never be able to be comfortable without using his gift. That God would constantly be pushing him and prodding him, encouraging him to be involved, to be touching other people's lives, and to be exercising his faith. Paul prayed that he might be part of the answer to his own prayers. Have you ever prayed that? God, I pray for this. Okay, show me how to be involved in seeing that answer. Paul said, I want to see those people established there. Get me there. Get me to Rome. And he prayed that God would get him to Rome. He knew that in Rome that no apostle had ever been there, that they'd never been established in the faith like they needed to, that a lot of people from different places had kind of gone to Rome and, and the church had started there and that they were very vulnerable. He was writing from a very wicked city called Corinth and he could see all the wickedness around him and he knew Rome had all these same issues. He wanted to get there like a baby out in traffic. I got to get out there and protect it. And he was praying that God would get him there as quickly as possible. And before he could get there, he wrote through the book of Romans everything that he could think of that they needed to know as a Christian church to establish them in their faith. In fact, this word for establish, we use the word today, but we kind of, uh, a better translation of the way we use it today is the word transplanted. Whenever you transplant anything, like this church had been transplanted into Rome, one of the things that you desire is that it will thrive in its new location. And anything that's transplanted, with, you know, an organ in the body, when it's placed there, there is this period of time of worry that it will be able to, to take root, to connect. And Paul was concerned that this church might not connect, that it was very vulnerable, and he needed to get there to get it established. A healthy Christian knows his spiritual gift. A healthy Christian is compelled to be used by God. They never get to the point about growing it or putting it on the shelf. They desire to be used by God with every breath that they have. Another thing is Paul wanted to be ministered to, not just minister to them, but he wanted to be ministered to by their faith. And you notice that, that he wanted to be blessed by their faith back to him as well. He wasn't such a big shot that he didn't think new believers could bless him. In fact, some of the greatest blessings there are from people who are new in the faith. You know, they challenge us about what is important and maybe what we're taking for granted. They bring this freshness back to the faith and excitement. And they remind us again how important it is to be praying, to be in God's word, to be excited about God's word, and to not just allow this drift to happen in our spiritual life, but to come back and be very close and connected and intimate in our walk with God. Paul prayed that his efforts might bring fruit to their lives. You see this in verse, verse 13. It says, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented thus far, so that I may up obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. Paul had been going through all the Gentile area and establishing churches, and that's the reason we've got so many books of the Bible that are named after cities, because Paul would start a work there and establish them, and he would have fruit among all these different Gentile areas. And he wanted that in Rome as well. And that was his compelling desire to see fruit grow there. He wanted to see the kind of fruit where we have addition to a church, the kind of fruit where you see attitudes change, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, where attitudes change, and then action fruit, where people begin to bear fruit in their life and see others come to faith in Christ through God using them. He wanted to establish that kind of fruit in Rome. And he had this compelling desire to do that. And Satan hated that. Satan was preventing him. Satan was trying to, to fight against all of this unfolding and happening. And, you know, Satan does not mind our church services so much. He doesn't mind us, you know, people joining or people in Sunday school. What he hates to see is fruit. What he hates to see is fruit. Religious activity doesn't bug him. He can deal with that. But whenever he sees fruit happening, whenever he sees people's lives beginning to look more and more like Jesus Christ, whenever he sees people getting excited about God's word, whenever he sees them becoming stronger prayer warriors, he gets worried. He doesn't like to see fruit. And the hindrances were there, but Paul was praying and Paul knew that the hindrances would ultimately lose in the end and that in God's timing, he would walk into that city of Rome. And that's exactly what did happen. Which is another barometer of our spiritual life, is how do we deal with adversity? 
Do we trust God more? Do we move closer to God or does it push us farther away from God? It moved Paul closer and closer to God. You know, God is wanting us to spend time with him and to, for him to put specific people on our hearts. God is in the people business. And if we spend appropriate time with him, God will put lost people on our heart. God will put hurting people on our heart. God will put uh, people who need to grow in their walk with him on our heart. And we'll begin to pray those types of prayer. God, help me to be more effective in touching those lives. We will pray prayers that are more consistent with where God's heart is. And the vision that God has for Hollybrook Baptist Church will begin to flesh itself out and be real. We'll begin to see it if we begin to really pursue the heart of God in our prayer time and not just give him these wish lists, but really pray like Paul prayed. Centuries ago, there was a European mountain village and a nobleman decided to do something nice for the village and he built a church. And he's a pretty insightful nobleman because whenever the church was done and the people came to see it, it was majestic, it was beautiful, but there was one thing unique about it. It didn't have any lamps in the church. And the people asked, you know, it's beautiful, but how is it going to be lit? There are no lamps here. They said, well, you see the brackets on the wall? I'm going to give every family their own lamp. And when you come to church, you bring your lamp and you put it on the wall and there will be light here. So every time you're at the church, you'll know that the church will have its light. But the times that you're not where God would have you to be, the church is going to see evidence of that. And there'll be darkness in the place that you should have been. You know, what could this church be? What could any church be? I mean, if we just turned out the lights of how appropriate to however many people are not exercising the gifts, living out in faith as God would have them to do, and that, that the effect that that would have on the church, I'm afraid to think of how many bulbs might be burning in here. But just imagine if everybody was exercised, praying like Paul, getting before God, God was speaking to them, exercising the faith of, and living out that gift, establishing, encouraging, and, and building fruit among others' lives. Imagine the powerful effect that it would have on the life of our church. Let's bow in.